All right. So as with any conference, uh, we do want to go ahead and thank all of our sponsors beforehand. Uh, so between ALA, the California Library School Association, San Jose State, and many more, uh, we can provide this conference not only uh, on a global scale, but entirely free and 24-7. So I'm very excited to be part of this. Uh, I did this conference last year, and it was a great experience. So uh, for any of you first timers, uh, think about presenting next year. It's kind of weird, but it's a lot of fun. and um, Let's just get right into it. I've got a lot of uh, interesting content, and uh, I'm glad that you've all chosen to join us. With that in mind, what we'd like to do is actually um, allow folks to go ahead and put in their location. Uh, so for me, I'm going to go ahead and put in around that Tennessee area. And then all you've got to do is select that little star along the right-hand side of the page and select where you are. So I've got someone in, looks like California. Maybe a New York or a Massachusetts. Maine, ah, you're way up there. And Hungary. Excellent. Okay, great. So it looks in Southern California, which is probably a little bit warmer than it is here, even in Memphis today. So I'm I'm a little jealous for your sunshine, but I suppose it's easier to. Um, present at a conference if, if I get to be a little chilly and indoors. All right. So uh, we've got my slides loaded, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So you're all here for uh, what I'm affectionately calling a mool in a MOOC, uh, but essentially librarians in massive open online courses. Let's go ahead and talk real quick about MOOCs and um, kind of why why they're so uh, abuzz in the news right now. So you've got the fact that MOOCs are massive open online courses, which makes them a hot topic for global education, a controversial topic for proprietary and copyrighted resources, as well as a huge source of debate for educators all over the world. So what's so hot about them? What's so controversial about them? All right. Um, faculty have wished for ways to participate in open education efforts um, for quite a bit of time. I, I knew I, I spent a year at Grinnell College, 2011-2012, uh, and faculty there were really, really interested in the concept of education and social justice. And so I think in part the open education efforts has to do with that interest in social justice. But it also has an interest in just plain old wanting to reach a broader audience. Um, for the students, it brings the opportunity for contact with education from some really excellent institutions. Um, of course, as long as you have an internet connection, right? So uh, there is sort of some fee to use because you've got to at least you know, be able to get to an internet cafe or something like that to actually spend time with the material. So then you've got uh, distance learning on a global and tuitionless scale, all right? And you have the questions surrounding that as to whether that's a good thing or a devaluation of the college education. Uh, there's a number of articles uh, in my notes for these slides. So. Um, if you have an interest in the slide notes, just go ahead and email me after the presentation. Um, but Steve Kolowicz wrote quite a few articles for the Chronicle of Higher Education that sort of call attention to the pros and the cons and what schools are actually struggling with having to do with, uh, with MOOCs. And not the least of all uh, includes, can you really learn in a MOOC? 
and who's looking after the quality of the MOOCs, and, and frankly, do, you know, do we care? If it's, if it's free, do we care about the quality of it? Um, you know, I guess it's the, the difference between just taking someone's car off the street and, you know, going out and buying a Lamborghini for yourself, and, you know, what are you looking to get out of the experience, and uh, how much do you actually want to pay for that? So I wanted to do three polls really quick. Um, and so we'll start with the first one. Uh, and what I'm looking for there is how many of you have participated in a MOOC as a student? Um, I don't care if you have finished it or, or anything like that. Um, so I've just got to. So I'll say that uh, I have participated in a MOOC. You've lurked. I count that. I count lurking. Great. So it looks like most of you have at least interacted with the MOOC in some sort of a way. So now um, I'm going to clear those out. And now I'm going to ask how many of you have actually completed a MOOC. And I know some of you have answered that in the chat box already. But go ahead and, and put some numbers up there just for the uh, historical record, if you will. Unfortunately for myself, I actually have to put a no for that. Um, I've, I've wanted to. I have wanted to so badly, and it just has not seemed to come together for me yet in terms of timing. Okay. So our numbers are actually kind of the reverse of what they were for the last question. We had four people who had been in MOOCs and one person who would completed it, and then four here who haven't been able to complete it and one who's actually been able to. Um, I, uh, I, you know, it wasn't the length of it. It said, uh, in addition to being a full-time faculty member, I am also um, pursuing a second master's. And so between that coursework and my full-time work, I, uh, I, I personally had a lot of struggle just sort of staying, staying dedicated to, you know, sort of this MOOC hobby of mine. All right, and so I'm going to clear that and I'm going to ask my final question, which is how many of you are here because you're a librarian who is interested in becoming part of the MOOC either at your institution or locally? Library student, Lucent, I'm going to count you. You're a future librarian. Okay, great. So um, thanks for going ahead and um, writing and, and pulling some of that information in. Uh, that just helps me get a sense of who you are and what brings you here today. So let's go ahead and um, what I'd like to do is talk about um, a few of the things that, that I have done in terms of my own research. So um, within the abstract for this presentation, uh, I wrote that I had done a survey uh, this past spring about sort of faculty and MOOCs and where they see MOOCs going and sort of how I then see librarians participating in that. Um, 
So first, I'd like to start with uh, the survey itself and talking a little bit about that. Um, there is a link to that on my website, which is also listed towards uh, the end of this presentation. Um, but if you'd like it now, I can also uh, show that to you in case it would be helpful. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and um, put that in the chat box there. Okay. So. Oops, wrong one. Sorry. Okay. So the goals of the survey were to discover variations in faculty status among MOOC faculty. Okay, whether MOOC faculty have part have established relationships with the library and or librarians at their home institutions. Whether MOOC faculty attempt to incorporate information literacy outcomes into their MOOC through learning objectives or other means. Whether librarians at the home institution of the MOOC faculty member have played a part in the MOOC course development process and to gain insights regarding institutional or other incentives for MOOC faculty, which may illuminate both barriers to and opportunities for librarians within MOOC. Another primary research goal was actually gauging MOOC faculty interest in and conceptualization of librarians within MOOC. Um, and that primary research goal was sort of what I was lightly trying to get at. So the survey itself uh, obviously wasn't perfect. They rarely are. Um, but it was a way of getting faculty, I guess, to think and um, to conceptualize what these relationships might be like moving forward. And so the methods I used um, to put together this survey and the information um, ultimately for the article that I put together included uh, an access database of Coursera courses, um, and there's sort of an, an as-by date on that. Um, a Qualtrics survey, which I had open from uh, mid-May through July 1st, and a few interviews that I did with uh, some relevant individuals. So with the access database, I put together a course title, uh, primary instructor's names, email address, which I gathered from hours of web searching, um, the course category and subject areas, the duration of the course, the estimated workload in hours, whether a signature track was available for that course, and if so, at what cost, um, the home institution of the primary instructor, the location of the home institution in terms of country, the language the MOOC was being offered in, um, names of additional instructors, uh, total number of non-primary instructors, things like that to get a sense of the, the level of teamwork necessary to put these together. Um, this provided me with an opportunity to understand the distribution of the subject areas, the engagement of international faculty members, uh, as I said, the, the extent of team teaching and uh, the average workload a course or a MOOC, MOOC student might anticipate doing in order to complete the MOOC. Um, this also allowed me to gauge the number of courses with TBA instructors, uh, so to be announced, um, instructors outside of traditional higher education institution, and to get a sense of how many survey participants uh, I may uh, that I may be reaching out to who may not have English as a first language. Uh, and so fluency in the actual survey instrument would be, would be complicated by things like that. The Qualtrics survey then uh, routed participants based on their responses. It allowed for a record of informed consent from participants, um, permitted pretty quick emailing of, of the participants as well as reminders. Um, and automated thank you messages to them as well. Um, questions in the survey were multiple choice, choose all that apply, or written responses. Uh, those were often used where I might hope for them to elaborate or give particular thoughts uh, in relationship to a question that I had posed. Um, and as I said, the complete survey is available uh, on my website. Um, the interviews, the individuals listed there, um, John Shank, if you don't know him, uh, is really interesting, does a lot of great work. 
Uh, he's the Associate Instructional Design Librarian at Penn State Berks. Um, Trey Martindale is an Associate Professor of Instructional Design and Technology at the University of Memphis. So rather than being within the libraries like John Shank is, he's actually within a Department of Instructional Design and Technology faculty members. And then Tim Bowen, who's actually the Director of Academic Services and Products at um, the Copyright Clearance Center. Um, and yeah, so that's, I mean, those are the basics of the people that, that I ended up talking to. So let's talk first about some of the findings within the Access Database itself. Um, Let's see, so uh, five MOOCs were, t were being taught in English, uh, eight in French, one in Italian, one in German, ten in Spanish. Um, those groups were surveyed, but I did anticipate that some of the participation levels may be low um, due to lack of fluency in English. Um, 19 courses were not hosted by traditional institutions of higher education. Uh, examples of that would include the American Museum of Natural History. 101 of these MOOCs, which uh, comprises about 28% um, of the courses on Coursera, would be hosted by institutions outside the United States. Um, examples of that were the Commonwealth Education Trust, which is in the UK, the University of Copenhagen, which is in Denmark, the University of Toronto in Canada. Uh, each of those was hosting eight MOOCs. Um, using the 25 different categories or subject areas that MOOCs identified, um, 194 or just over half of them uh, were listed for more than one category. Um, so this to me would indicate some interdisciplinary collaboration between MOOC faculty as well. Um, 67 or 20 percent of the MOOCs, uh, or the, the MOOCs faculty members rather, so um, sorry, that 67 percent of, I keep messing that up one more time, I'm giving it one more time, 20 percent of the MOOCs faculty members surveyed were female. Um, now that may indicate um, sort of general statistics within higher education. Um, from the survey results, which we'll see on the next slide, um, there may be indications about level of tenure and things like that also that come into play. So it may be statistically relevant the number of women who were um, primary instructors for MOOC. Fourteen courses uh, anticipated student workload would be a minimum of 10 hours per week. Fifty of them anticipated coursework would consume up to ten hours per week. So there's the minimum and then there's the up to. 109 anticipated between one and five hours of coursework per week. So you can get a sense there of how much work uh, the average course is anticipating. Eleven MOOCs on Coursera had a signature track available. This was pretty new when I was doing the survey. I hadn't noticed it previously, uh, but the signature track is a fee base. And uh, the, the fees range from $39 to $79 for the course. Um, these numbers should just give us a sense of what the students have to choose from in terms of subjects and workload, who's involved, what institutions are engaged, and, and who's pursuing for-profit options as well. So then we can actually get into the Qualtrics survey and the results that I found from that. The vast majority of MOOC faculty were tenured. Um, so that's a full 70% of those who responded were tenured faculty at their institution. So again, looking at the number of women participating, the number of women generally who are full tenured faculty members is a little lower than men. So um, that's sort of to be expected in the MOOC arena as well, um, but that was pretty interesting to me. Um, many of the faculty who participated also reached out after the thank you message, uh, indicating interest in the presentation and um, survey results and articles that may be from it, etc. Um, the concept of a MOOC was foreign 
to some of the MOOC faculty on Coursera, uh, but when loosely defined was somewhat in use or favorably imagined by those who responded to the survey. Uh, several of those respondents made common suggestions or shared similar thoughts. Uh, so my feeling was that it's, it's critical that faculty members are at least aware that librarians may be interested in engaging with MOOCs. Additionally, faculty members also need to have some understanding of what their librarians may be able to contribute. They need not aim to incorporate every librarian's strength, tool, resource, etc., but it's a lot easier to pick the proper tool in the toolbox if you know what the tool does. Uh, questions 25, 28, 31, and 32 of the survey try to get at faculty thoughts on librarians in their MOOCs in particular. Uh, repetition of a number of their comments, especially in the questions that I just noted, uh, leads me to believe that there are at least a few common understandings of the role librarians can serve and whether and how that may be applicable uh, to the MOOC. These trends include uh, librarians as resource creators, librarians as experts or support for course content design and delivery, and librarians as hubs for knowledge and negotiation of copyright and access. Um, so I thought that was, that was pretty interesting. It may be the ways that they are most often engaging with librarians at their home institutions, and so they see this as an extension of the services perhaps already provided. Um, so let's get into some of those details. Looking at resource creation and uh, course content design and delivery. Uh, so some of the quotes that I actually got back are, are pretty interesting with regard to resource creation. Um, one participant said, I asked a librarian to film two videos on how to locate information and do online research. The difference between peer-reviewed and popular literature, locating open access material, things like that. So I thought um, that was pretty useful. Those are the kinds of things that they at least want explained to their audience, whether it's something that they have you know, local applicability for. How available that is to them is, is a whole other thing, but at least gaining the knowledge as to what types of resources we're talking about and how to access or locate it, that's, that's pretty common. Um, another suggested that librarians had assisted them with establishing learning outcomes, um, as well as uh, incorporating materials developed by librarians for research assistance evaluating sources. Um, they believed that all of those were repurposed from previously prepared library skills and teaching materials. And so I think that's a good way for us to say, well, look, we don't have to do that much extra work to help you. We're already developing this kind of content. Let us modify it for your purposes. Um, other MOOC faculty are aware of the fact that their particular MOOC, which is often in the sciences, may not be suited or easily suited to this kind of partnership. Um, as with on-campus collaborations, librarian, librarians engaged in resource creation uh, must tailor to the course its needs and its population. And so um, I know I myself has a, have a liaison responsibility to the sciences, and I may have a hard time getting into those classrooms for instruction, but there may be other avenues worth exploring or other, um, other conversations that need to be had. Um, with regard to course content, design, and delivery, uh, many faculty indicated that teaching assistants, graduate assistants, student workers, and other forms of human resource capital had at times been made available to them, often perceived as a form of incentive. Um, so, you know, hey, if you're going to be teaching a MOOC, we'll offer you an additional GA or a student assistant or two or three. Um, the high estimates of the time it would take to actually put a MOOC together, um, those estimates range from anything between 30 and 60 hours to thousands of hours. And so part of that time may be adding in time that GAs were spending, time that uh, the entire group of you know, four or five faculty members who may be teaching a given MOOC are also developing, uh, are also devoting to developing course content. Um, the other part of this to explore, of course, is the fact that um, many of them 
who indicated that they had used embedded librarians on campus had felt that it was it was a clear advantage to them. And so when they're talking about using those embedded librarians in their courses, they are also perhaps indicating a willingness to bring librarians into other virtual course atmospheres. Um, I don't know if this was pure coincidence or not, but there were 14 respondents indicating that they had used embedded librarians in their courses. There were also 14 respondents who indicated that they had involved librarians in their MOOCs. So it's not completely clear if these were the same individuals who were indicating that. Um, but I think the number is, uh, is pretty convenient. Um, at the very least, the chances then of you perhaps getting embedded in a course might be about equal for you to actually get involved in a MOOC. And then looking forward towards copyright and access, I think many, many of those in the room may be aware of the fact that librarians are, are frequently engaged in discussions about and workshops involving copyright, open access, fair use, creative commons, many other arguments regarding copyright and, and access. Um, you might be an institutional liaison for copyright purposes. You may be instructing students on plagiarism. You might be discussing the frustrations of, importance of obtaining copyright clearance to faculty members for electronic resources, what open access is, and, and all these different nuances of copyright. And so because we're often arranging electronic and print reserve items, many of us also administer or, or clear PDFs for content management systems such as Blackboard. Uh, many also assist student and faculty members with printing and scanning. And that also becomes part of copyright. As well as, of course, looking at ebooks uh, and how much you can print, how much you can't print, etc. Given the wealth of direct and indirect copyright related activities in which librarians engage, it seems a pretty natural fit that faculty instructing in MOOCs would approach librarians about course content concerns, issues, availability, and negotiation. Furthermore, I think as the MOOC grows in a credit-bearing direction, as some institutions are looking to do, and we'll talk about that a little bit further down the road here, librarians will be an important institutional resource, at the very least, in looking at these copyright issues. So staying current with that and becoming engaged in that would be something that would certainly um, behoove librarians across the country. Um, I had mentioned earlier that I had had um, a conversation with Tim Bowen at the Copyright Clearance Center. And part of what he discussed was that uh, the Copyright Clearance Center had piloted a partnership with the Stanford Intellectual Property Exchange, which is FIPEX, with a Stanford course uh, offered on Coursera uh, back in spring 2013. And he said the goal was to create the equivalent of a course pack, where if students wanted to, they could enroll in the MOOC and pay to have access to these course materials. Uh, these were one-offs. They were only certain items or sections in, in which they were interested if they wanted. So if they only wanted week two's material, they could just purchase that. Um, or they could purchase the entire course pack. If they didn't, they would still have access to all the lectures, quizzes, et cetera, um, but they were just not getting this additional copyrighted material. Bowen had stated that roughly 4,000 students had completed the MOOC, uh, which you can imagine the size of the MOOC in that case with um, oftentimes about a 10% uh, <laughs> completion rate. So it seems it's really reaching a massive audience. Um, but about 40,000 completed the MOOC and approximately 1,200 to 1,300 of them had purchased the course pack. By the way, these course packs ran about 98 bucks a piece. So there's, there is money to be made here and, and I have reservations uh, about some of that, but at the very least people were willing to pay something 
for the additional content, and it allowed the content to be accessed in a fully legal way, which I should support. Um, this, uh, this conversation with Tim took place after the ALA conference in June of 2013. Um, he had, uh, the Copyright Clearance Center had a luncheon of some sort that I attended, and so he and I had a, a, a long conversation afterwards. Uh, but the meeting in general, uh, the first item on their agenda was talking about uh, MOOCs and, and libraries. And it was a very engaging discussion. Um, part of it was that they were interested in knowing if this specific option was something that librarians felt would be a viable option moving forward, whether we had additional ideas or concerns. Um, they're hoping to unveil this option uh, a little bit more broadly within the next few months. Uh, because librarians have long had a strong voice in the argument for information access and freedom of speech, and librarians are clearly seen as an important community to, um, to consult with this discussion of copyright access and, uh, and open education. It really was quite a good discussion. That said, I also think that the open access movement will provide compelling opportunities for MOOC content in the sciences in particular, um, as major industrialized countries like the US and the UK pursue making publicly funded research freely available to the public. Um, for example, um, anything that, uh, say, the NIH funds needs to be made publicly accessible. And anything, obviously, that's open access on the internet is publicly accessible as well. And so that should create some more content options for people teaching MOOCs in the sciences in particular. Um, and those medicine, technology, and science subject areas account for about half of the MOOCs available on Coursera right now. So I see not only these course pack con concepts as well as open access um, trajectories helping to move both of these courses into more accessible areas. You know, that's a great question about the perception of average level of librarian copyright knowledge among the participants. Um, that was not something that, uh, that anyone really made clear. Um, it will also depend institution to institution. Um, so I should say that the I, don't know, I think I had about 70 or so respondents. Um, that really was, was not quite the threshold that I would have wanted in order to have statistically significant results. So I do have some concerns about that. But I, again, I was kind of really looking more for opinions and where we may have uh, a foot in the door or you know a hand stuck in a window somewhere where we can actually uh, have discussions with faculty about what we could provide. So I suppose the best answer I could give is that if you are at a school that has a huge knowledge of copyright, um, Harvard would be a good example of this. If you've got a vast knowledge of copyright that you can then apply, if you've already been having discussions about faculty publications and copyright at your institution, then certainly you're going to be known as a location to provide that kind of information. Uh, if your school handles that differently or does not pursue those sorts of discussions with your university, that's a relationship that you would have to build on the ground uh, with your institution, I think, before you could then have, uh, have applications at the level of the MOOC. That would be my bet, but again, I can't, I can't tell directly from the survey uh, the average level of perceived librarian knowledge. Um, I do think in general it is of growing importance that librarians learn more about copyright and have a firmer understanding of that, so it certainly can't hurt uh, to, to increase their, perce their perceived uh, average level of our knowledge. I hope that, that's a helpful answer. I know it's not a concrete answer, but I hope it's at least helpful. Um, all right, so I want to talk a little bit more about some additional feedback here, uh, because this is where I thought some of, some of the real meat came out, and again, my primary goal was also to 
get people to think about this. Um, anyone who tried to talk with a faculty member about coming into their classroom for instruction, I think a lot of times we have to give them concrete examples of how we can help them. And in that way, if they haven't stopped and thought about how we could help them before, they don't necessarily know. So this survey was trying to get at some of the ways that not only they're using librarians at their institutions, but after that, how maybe planting a few of those seeds might get them to think about uh, using librarians in other aspects of their work as well. So um, question 33 uh, tried to get at whether respondents thought a Coursera provided librarian would be useful. So looking at sort of an embedded librarian from the Coursera angle rather than from the institutional angle. And I thought that this, this might be pretty interesting. And only 13%, this is about 22% of those who responded, only about 13 respondents felt that they would take advantage of a Coursera provided librarian. The majority of them gave, gave more of a maybe. Um, based on those responses to, um, to that question and some of the follow-up questions, I think there are several reasons why faculty may not want to jump at that. Um, so I've got a few comments there related to that. So one respondent said, I think a local contact is better. Um, another said, I'd prefer to make one of our institution's librarians a partner in our course and deliver library services I have confidence in. Um, additionally, they say Coursera is a for-profit company. Frankly, their goals are entirely different than those of an instructor. And so, as I say on this slide here, I think having a librarian play a role in your course involves trust on the behalf of the faculty member. So, it's just as us coming in their classroom, if they know we're a person that their students are going to get help from, if they know that we're going to be able to deliver the kind of instruction that they're looking for, then I think they, they can kind of sit back and know that things are going to be handled well. Um, because Coursera has, has different goals, um, because they are removed, and, and it's funny because you're talking about MOOCs, you're talking about global courses here and global education, but they still see Coursera as something that is physically removed from where they are. Um, because of those things, I think the trust level isn't necessarily complete. They're, they're looking to participate um, in this, and Coursera is a platform for that. It may be a platform that their institution has chosen rather than they individually have chosen. So there are things like that that come into play, but it's really what they're saying is about having trust in the person that they're inviting to assist their course. Um, a few additional thoughts and feedback that I got uh, included um, MOOCs could certainly benefit from knowledge, content, knowledge management teams. Several NGOs that are involved in continuing education frame this in the context of knowledge management, program learning, and the like, and, ex and an expanded definition of a librarian certainly is valuable there. I thought that was very interesting, that idea of the librarian being part of sort of a MOOC knowledge management team rather than just, you know, little old librarians shushing everybody on the discussion boards, which is, of course, not what we want to be known for. Um, one person uh, sort of critiqued me a little bit, but in a very helpful way. Um, they said two-thirds of the academic work involves the online questions. So the online questions embedded within Coursera for quizzes and testings, et cetera. And they said, you know, I hadn't asked about that, which, you know, I hadn't. And it says, the issues are identifying suitable questions, deciding the format of the questions, entering questions, and testing questions. In my subject, I think, and I think in most others, good questions, well formulated, are hard to find. I wonder if there might be a lot of expertise among the community of librarians that might be brought to bear. And so that is getting at partly our research ability, partly our critical thinking skills, and a way in which they're allowing us to help shape some of those learning outcomes. Because certainly what you're testing for, you know, kind of impacts what you're actually able to 
receive back in terms of learning. So that, that, that was pretty interesting. Um, someone else said that they had just participated in a virtual panel on MOOCs organized by the Association of College and Research Libraries, so ACRL. It confirmed my opinion that librarians are way ahead of most academics when it comes to the transformative power of inter information technology. So librarians engage in instructional design, in emerging technologies, in instructional technologies, in uh, virtual assistance, distance education, all those areas in which we engage with our systems and our services through technology, I think, is what they're getting at there. And um, this is something that we've been doing for years and years now. Um, so I thought that was uh, also pretty cool. Um, and the last comment I'll read says, I believe that the overall issue of librarianship has so far received insufficient attention in the discussion on MOOC. There is an unfounded belief that the brave new world of online learning relegates libraries to a secondary position. This is, in my view, wrong. Libraries remain indispensable, and we have been extremely grateful for the support we have received from the Royal Library of Denmark. And so in that statement, that's obviously coming from an international library, which I thought was pretty great, too. But also, you know, that sort of unites the front on the sense that, OK, so nationally, internationally, this concept that, that we've heard time and time again of libraries becoming obsolete, librarians becoming obsolete, books becoming obsolete, all these different things engaged with librarianship becoming obsolete is, is completely unfounded. Things have to shift. But um, as uh, some of, uh, forgetting the exact article that I had read, but it'll be in the bibliography of the article um, of the similar title to this publication, but it talks about how, um, you know, we're one of the best change managers in terms of a field and skill sets that there are. Librarians are change managers. We have managed to go from the papyrus to the ebook and digital collections and digital repositories and everything in between. And so we have made these changes fluently and with excitement and maybe a little bit of grumpiness, but that's usually because we have to provide metadata or something, and you know that's a whole other issue. So uh, I thought that was very interesting. Um, and these statements also highlighted for me that there are several areas of collaboration that hadn't been you know, that I hadn't, you know, really thought about yet, um, which to me is a wonderful thing, and that this is creating a dialogue for collaboration, um, and that's completely necessary if we are going to be more involved. It's not just on our terms, and it's not just um, on their terms. So I also wanted to identify a few areas for future research, um, and of course, my first plug here is, if you're interested, get in touch, because uh, I would love to collaborate further. But um, as I said initially, the, the participation rate for the survey was about 18%. Um, I could have used about double that, to be honest. Um, I've seen things that say that about 30% is what you're looking for from online surveys, and I just wasn't there yet. Um, but the experience and the thoughts of the faculty that did participate really generated a wealth of ideas for me uh, for future research. And, and I hope uh, some of these will, will interest you as well. Um, so as we're trying to figure out what our role is in MOOCs and where we want to go with it, uh, I had about six ideas. And I'm going <laughs> to show you three per slide. Um, so the first idea was that further research into whether MOOC faculty members who are regular users of their institutional libraries and librarians more or less predictively have an interest in bringing librarians into their MOOCs. Uh, as institutionally run and credit bearing courses become more and more popular and prevalent, I expect that institutional libraries and their librarians will become more and more involved. Uh, additionally, it may be easier to survey uh, in that regard because you could look institution by institution rather than approaching all course or a faculty, which is what I did. Um, idea two, uh, I was thinking that as um, 
as humanities move, continue to develop and become more popular, uh, currently more offered for the physical, biological, and social sciences, uh, I think our special collections and archives of, of our libraries and other rev relevant library collections, uh, whether they're academic institution based or not, uh, will become more involved in MOOCs too. Um, I would love to see this relationship develop and I would love to have research that helps that along the way. Um, the way I would see it is uh, libraries often see users in the humanities more often than we see users in physics. And if that's the case, then as more humanities MOOCs start coming out, we might expect more librarian involvement in the humanities courses because that's what they're used to doing. And that's a way that they're used to engaging in, uh, in research and education and learning, et cetera. Um, the next idea has to do with copyright. So uh, given the fact that I had that conversation with Tim Bowen at ALA, um, I don't think it should be the end of the discussion. I doubt it will be the end of the discussion. Um, I'd like to see future research regarding the impacts of these partnerships between Copyright Clearance Center and CIPEX and, and developing course packs for fee and things like that. Um, I think the research that would be most important uh, would be involving the completion rate of the courses. So does having a course pack, does having a fee encourage you to actually complete the course? Um, I could certainly see if I paid $100 for some of the MOOCs I've tried to do. Uh, that, would, that would be uh, an investment at that point rather than the hobby that I kind of called it earlier. Um, looking at how MOOC faculty respond to these fees, uh, as I noted at the beginning of the presentation, I think a lot of faculty were interested in social justice and providing open access to education. And so I wonder if faculty will resist uh, the course pack fees. I also wonder if students will respond uh, with resistance to the course pack fees. Uh, certainly uh, $100 in US currency is a little devalued at the moment. Uh, I think the government shut down for about two weeks. So that, that impacted the dollar a little bit. but. Um, in other countries, that's a tremendous amount of money that just would not enable the kind of access to educational opportunities that students uh, are looking for. I'd also wonder if those students and those faculty end up coming together to work to circumvent or avoid those barriers to access. They might be financial, they might have to do with international copyright regulation, um, faculty interests, publisher agreements, all sorts of things. Um, there was a conference with OCLC at the University of Pennsylvania in March of 2013, which also raised the question of whether tuition translates to productivity. So as I indicated earlier, if I'd paid $98 for a course pack for a course, would that have actually generated productivity if I can't also have more hours in my day in which to do the work? Um, so it's a fair point. It's a good thing to ask. Certainly there are people who want to learn for the sake of learning and not just for the sake of, um, you know, paying for the experience. And I think we've all seen students who pay plenty for their education and are absolutely fine getting very little out of it. So, you know, it's really going to continue uh, spanning the gamut, I think, of, of different perceptions. Um, so we'll get to ideas four, five, and six, and then uh, I will be pretty much done, and I will open it up to a few questions. So looking at idea four, okay, um, the idea of MOOC investment and platform level and the institutional level investment, um, you've got dropouts, you have plagiarism, you have learning outcome issues, uh, problems with assessments and measurability, um, user, privacy and, uh, user privacy and authenticity issues, honor codes, et cetera. You've got all those things sort of playing in just as in the normal classroom, right? So at the most basic level, the resources devoted to the delivery and success of any MOOC should supplement 
the attention an institution devotes to its paying customers, so its original students. So we still need to make sure that we're giving the education that we need to give to the students who are at our institutions, um, and then perhaps supplement that experience and the opportunities that we have for our faculty uh, with these MOOC options, which is probably why you're seeing so many tenured faculty able to do this as opposed to tenure track faculty. Uh, the capital intensive investments of human resources, programming, technology, and support systems should drive the ability to create, hone, and sustain these global education efforts, but it is capital intensive. Uh, there was an article in late April in the Chronicle of Higher Education by T. Hugh Crawford that said to MOOC or not to MOOC is not really the question. The real issue is how brick and mortar institutions could embrace MOOCs while continuing to build on the strengths of local capital intensive pedagogical practices, actual in the flesh pedagogy in a world of Coursera. I thought that was a really great quote. So he doesn't want us to turn a blind eye to opportunities beyond our own doorstep, but to keep in mind that home is where the heart is and where we can do always, and, and, and there's much we can do always to better how we educate the students who are already paying us for the privilege. And so do we meet in the middle regarding resource allocation uh, or not? I think for those who are looking to create institutional platforms, whether for credit or free, um, institutional faculty members have already used MOOCs hosted by for-profit entities, and those people will have the advantage of having experimented with these learning environments already, so we're already sort of developing some strengths at home. Um, they'll have delivered video lectures with quizzes embedded in them, created weekly or bi-weekly quizzes with honor codes, uh, math assignments, use peer review options in that setting, et cetera. Um, and I think that should sort of be part of how we understand not only what we're doing in the MOOC, but how we can also bring that home to benefit us. So from there, we can take a look at idea five. If the MOOC is to live on, I think it will in a variety of permutations, we'll need to continue developing ways to strengthen the level of engagement that students have within the MOOC the accountability and ethics of those taking it, the technological elements that we're using to deliver the content, um, especially as those things relate to and increase the chances of students completing the course and their ability of, um, rather the, the course's ability to use adaptive instruction to increase skills development and knowledge retention. Uh, so research deeper into those features and how they support learning outcomes knowledge building, information retention, student engagement, and so forth will be critical to the profitable development of MOOC as well as the experience of the non-paying students. So it should benefit both groups. Finally, I think that special collections, archival, and outreach librarians should also keep an eye on these developments and ways that they might support them. Um, I could see this as a way that librarians could demonstrate and highlight their value, uh, which we're always struggling to do. Uh, an example might be using it to propel digital collections. So if there's a civil rights course being offered by your institution and you have a fantastic, you know, nationally known civil rights collection, bringing 2,000 to 10,000, say, unique users to your digitized collections over the course of one course, which might run as few as three weeks, people all over the globe would be huge, both internally, institutionally, and among libraries. And so the statistics there wouldn't be terribly difficult to gather, but they could be very profitable in showing engagement with your collection. So I'll make a few final remarks and we'll, we'll open it up. All right. So I think a few things might come for the future of MOOCs. Um, as I said, there are going to be people who want the, the, the free education um, and who may not be able to pay for it. And so there's always going to be people pursuing free educational opportunities. Then we'll also find those who are willing to pay because they seek credit for completing the course. 
Um, and so these fees may not be prohibitive to certain people, and that's also great. Within the educational community, um, you know, we've already begun sort of modifying how we look at things in response to the MOOC. Uh, for example, Harvard requires their students to take an intro economics class MOOC uh, with Brigham Young rather than taking the course with Harvard, which I thought was pretty fascinating. Um, but in my discussion with Tim Bowen from the Copyright Clearance Center, he noted that those who might suffer include community colleges and their faculty. Students might be able to replace four credit cor uh, courses there, um, which are often used for placement and transfer into four-year schools, with the burgeoning for credit MOOCs, which may be done much more cheaply by far more uh, illustrious institutions. But I do think that, um, finally, within the education sphere, we do need to keep our eye out for or continue trying to develop an open education system that stays open. Uh, there's a blogger named Ed Techie, and I thought he summed it up very nicely. He said, so what about MOOCs? You know, those free open courses, is this the end of them? No, I don't think so, but maybe they can now become what we always wanted them to be focused on access and experimentation, not hype and commercialism. And so I think if we kind of as librarians keep that in mind, that it's, it's a service, it's an opportunity that people don't often get to have, um, and, and keep our eye on return on investment as a way to generate a smarter, more curious global community, a more engaged global, global community, I think we'll have something on our hands, but we've got to make sure that, that we do try to keep a free option available to people all over the world. Now that we've opened that floodgate, I think it needs to stay open somewhere. So that about wraps it up for me, but I would love to hear any questions or address any questions that you may have uh, if I can. Um, well, as I said, uh, the, one of the questions is, um, was there any suggestion from MOOC instructors of, of novel services that librarians could provide in MOOCs that I hadn't thought of before? And I do think that that concept of creating the knowledge management team uh, was very interesting. And I think really with librarians, it's not such a, a matter of um, services that I hadn't thought of before, but perhaps it's hearing it in faculty terminology. So it's understanding not just the, the skills and expertise that, that we as librarians think librarians can offer, but also understanding the terminology and the skills and expertise that faculty see within librarians as well. So that knowledge management team, that, um, that copyright expert, which I don't know many libraries that necessarily have one person who who serves as their job title as the copyright expert, you know, um, a few other things like that. I don't I don't think I think in those terminologies, and rightfully so, because I'm I'm within that inside group. But externally to libraries, I think we need to start understanding how to market ourselves to them in their words, because this is their class, this is their product, and this is something that they are using to show their expertise to the whole world. And so if we can take a look at their terminology and start trying to build upon that, I think that's a, that's a door that, um, that we don't use all that often. We're constantly trying to get people to understand our terminology and our uh, concepts like embedded librarianship and and preservation and things like that. We're trying to get them to understand what we do, but we're not necessarily thinking of what we do in their terminology. You're very welcome, Eileen. I'm glad you could join us.
All right. Thanks, everybody, for attending. It's been a pleasure presenting. And uh, please do feel free to uh, follow up and, and collaborate away and, and really try to think about um, you know, what impact we might make in the MOOC atmosphere.